I'm Gene Siskel. Of all the programs that Roger Ebert and I have ever done on sneak previews, one of the most popular was an unusual one we did early last year called Gene and Roger Go to the Movies. That was the one where we talked about the job of a movie critic, step by step. What we hear about a movie before it opens, what our expectations are, what we're thinking about while we watch the film, and what goes into writing our reviews. Reviewing movies sometimes become second nature after a while, so it was interesting for us to really break down the process and take a look at it together. A lot of people have asked us to repeat the show, so here it is. please. Yeah, Gene? John Iltis. Uh, can you make a screening of the Black Marble on uh, Wednesday at 2 o'clock? Okay, good. Uh, I'll call Roger. Okay, thanks a lot. He's a crazy L.A. cop. Ah! I'm nervous, sorry. She's a lonely L.A. cop. Groovy. He's a crazy, lonely L.A. crook. Ransom on the installment plan? You want to send me your damn credit card, maybe? And this is the Black Marble, a motion picture different than anything Joseph Wambaugh has ever written. You know, I don't even know your first name. Who are you? Andrushka. Andrushka. That's how it begins. That's how a new movie comes to town, with a press agent first inviting Roger and me to a special screening, and then the public is lured into theaters by a coming attractions commercial. And exactly how Roger and I go to the movies as critics is the subject of this special Take-Two program on sneak previews, and this is Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And this is Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Now, on this show, we're going to invite you to come along with us as we see the new comedy, The Black Marble. We'll take you to the little screening room where we see a lot of the new films. We'll try to explain what goes through our minds as we're watching a movie. And then we'll take you back to our offices as we write our reviews. Using The Black Marble as an example, we're going to try to solve one of the minor mysteries of the <laughs> world, which is exactly how do critics come to have their opinions. We'll try to explain that step by step in this special show. We're going to leave this balcony for about 10 minutes to show you some film footage shot by a camera crew that followed us around on the job. We'll take you into that screening room where you'll see full length scenes from the black marble. But we'll begin by taking you to our newspaper offices where Roger and I each talked about what our expectations were before we saw the movie. Expectations do, I think, play a small role in our final opinions. First, my office at the Chicago Tribune. All that I know about the black marble before I go in to see the picture is that it's made by the same people who made the onion field last year, which gets me a little bit excited because I happen to like the onion field last year. In fact, I put it on my top ten list of films for the entire year. Same director, Harold Becker, same screenwriter, Joseph Wambau. I'm looking forward to it on that basis. And on one other basis, a friend of mine, the TV critic who works here at the Tribune, Gary Deeb, he knows Wambau. Wambau showed him the film, The Black Marble, a month ago, and Deeb told me he liked it. So I've got that anticipation. He also told me, though, Deeb said, it's a comedy. Now I'm skeptical a little bit because the Onion Field was a police thriller. This new one's a comedy. It's very tough to be able to do both kinds of films. So a little bit of anticipation and a little bit of skepticism before I go to see The Black Marble. Oddly enough, I know less about the Black Marble than I usually know about a movie before I go to review it. I knew we were going to do it on this show, and so I deliberately tried to avoid finding out a whole lot about it. And so, what do I know about the Black Marble? Uh, I interviewed Joseph Wambaugh when he was making his previous film, The Onion Field, and so I know from that the Black Marble is directed by the same man, Harold Becker. I know that it's based on Wambaugh's only comic novel. I know it has something to do with the people who enter dogs in dog shows. And that's about it. I don't even know who the stars of this movie are. I haven't read the book the film is based on. I did get one of these press kits listing a lot of technical information. I'll look at that when it comes time to write the review and I'll say I've forgotten who the editor was or the cinematographer or something like that. Basically, I'm walking in hoping it's a good picture, which is sort of the way I like to feel whenever I go to review a movie. So what are my expectations about this film? 
Well, in the first place, I haven't talked to anyone who's already seen it, so I haven't been told that it's good or bad. Uh, I do know, though, that it was produced, directed, and written by the same team that made The Onion Field, and I thought that was a good film. So obviously my expectations are high. I hope The Black Marble will be at least as good. I have not read the novel by Wambaugh. I have it at home on my shelf, but I haven't read it. And in fact, I have a policy that when a new book comes out and I know it's going to be filmed, I won't read it. I don't want to know what's between the covers. I don't want to walk into the screening and be thinking, is the movie faithful to the book? Have they changed the characters and things like that? I want the film going experience to be as fresh as possible. And I want to be as open as possible when I go to a screening. And I always try to go to a screening with a full stomach. Now here I am at the little popcorn shop a half a block from the screening room where I see all the movies. I always come here because the screening room popcorn at the theater there, it stinks. This stuff is very fresh. Caramel and cheese corn for a buck twenty-one. This stuff is terrific. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. This is the Chicago Theater on State Street. It's the third largest theater in the country, but Inside, on the seventh floor, is the smallest theater in Chicago. It's actually a private screening room where Gene and I see most of the new movies before they open. The entrance is around the corner and down the alley. People sometimes ask if it has an effect on a movie critic to go to a screening and see the film like this all alone without an audience. In my case, I don't think so. I see some movies in screening rooms like this. I see other movies in regular theaters. Buy a ticket, go in, sit with the audience. In both cases, I try to be as objective as possible in reporting what happens between me and the screen. Hi, Gene. Hi, Roger. How are you doing? Okay. In every theater, I have a favorite seat I like to sit in, sort of habit. In this screening room, I like to sit in the last row, sort of off to the side. The last row because it's the only row that doesn't have any rocking chair seats. And in some bad movies, rocking chair seats can really lull you to sleep. You know, it is a funny thing about going to the movies. When you go to a couple hundred movies a year, you do get into rituals, patterns of habit. I usually sit in this seat, for example, and I don't know why. I guess it's just a habit with me. I do know that when I go to a regular movie theater, no matter where it is, I always have the same kind of strategy when I walk in. I always choose a seat that's twice as far back from the screen as the screen is wide. Now, there's a theory that that ratio is right in terms of your eyes, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it seems to work for me. Sometimes people wonder whether critics take notes in the movies. I happen to do so. I started about 10 years ago doing it. I think it's because I was a reporter before I was a movie critic. So in effect, just like a reporter going to a fire, I take notes on my reactions to the movies. Also some facts and figures so I don't have to remember, for example, how much somebody robs a bank for. Uh, one funny thing about this note taking, when I go back to write the review with the newspaper, I rarely look at my notes. I usually don't take notes when I watch a movie. I tried it uh, years ago when I started as a film critic and I found it to just be a big distraction. I was always writing notes while something else was happening in the movie and to me it's just a lot better to let the movie happen and then if there's something in the film that's worth remembering, I find that I remember it. Well, it's no big deal, but I am able to take notes in the dark. In fact, one of the gifts that I often get are lighted pens. I've got about eight of them at home, haven't used a single one. Finally, when we get everything together, our notepads, our popcorns, our pens, whatever, and also our eyes, of course, finally it's time to signal the projectionist to start the movie. One of us just goes over and flicks these light switches down here. the opening scenes of the black marble and now the action begins with a creep trying to extort the owner of a prize-winning show dog Hello. is this madeline whitfield yes my name is richard i want to tell you that uh that schnauzer bitch you have is not vicky understand me that schnauzer bitch you have is not vicky now you'll you'll know that when she revives from the tranquilizer that i gave her uh, ex excuse me, I, I don't understand. I'm telling you that I've kidnapped your schnauzer bitch. You have another one. Now listen to me. I want eighty-five thousand uh, dollars. How much? Eighty-five thousand. Uh, uh, I, oh, that's impossible. I don't have eighty-five thousand dollars. I can't get $85,000. You, you listen to me. I know all about you. You're rich, you and your big house. Yeah, yeah, just do as I say, okay? 
No, listen, listen to me, sir. I, uh, this, this big house, I live here alone, and the upstairs is closed off, and I had to refinance the house last year. I don't have listen, any... Listen, I don't... Shut up! The dog owner contacts the police. Assigned to the case, detectives Robert Foxworth and Paula Prentice, uneasy police partners working together for the very first time. Sergeant, I've managed to raise $20,000, and I decided that if you release Vicky unharmed, I'm going to give it to him. For a dog? That's stupid. Natalie, please. Miss Woodfield, Sergeant Zimmerman didn't mean to imply that uh, you Oh, were... hell, I didn't. Miss Woodfield, stupid. what I'm hoping is that we can arrange a money drop tomorrow and that you'll trust me to arrange a surveillance. If it looks too chancy, we'll let the money go. Would you agree to that? Malnikoff, we're talking about a dog. What do you mean, let the money go? Sergeant, you know I trust you. I'm not running into a burning house to save a bowl of goldfish. And I'm not going to sit here while you two try to convince me that we're talking about anything but a dog. I'm going outside for a smoke. I'll bet you would run into a burning house to save a bowl of goldfish. Later in the movie, the cops start falling in love. At a Russian restaurant, they begin to recognize their affection for each other. The comic you. extortion story is now turning into a romance. Have you noticed that your mind wanders a bit? Well, maybe you've had enough vodka. Huh? But... Just keep answering my questions, Valnikov. You got your case, I got mine. Let's go to your case, I mean place, so I can work on my case. My, my place? Yeah. You got any Russian vodka there? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, now, I'm not being chauvinist, honest. It's just that uh, you know, Russians love to give flowers. Help me cough. You're a crazy, crazy man. As the film draws to a conclusion, Detective Robert Foxworth closes in on Harry Dean Stanton, the desperate dog napper. The cop chases him through a kennel as they climb over cages of snarling dogs. So there you have a pretty good overview of the whole film in terms of the story, the characters, and so on. And also some of the process we go through before we see a new movie. But, you know, sometimes people ask, what are you thinking about while you're sitting there in the screening room? Do movie critics watch a movie any differently than the average moviegoer? Well, yes and no. On the one hand, I'm sitting there taking in the film like anybody else, but on another level, I'm monitoring my own responses. Yeah, I've often described the being movie critic as having sort of two tracks running inside of my head. One track reacts to the picture, the other track analyzes what those reactions are. If I see a good performance, for example, not only do I see it, but I try to figure out what's so good about it, the particulars about it. So now, we're going to take a look at two scenes from The Black Marble that had a big impact on Roger and me. You'll see the scenes and eavesdrop on what our mental reactions were what we were actually thinking about the first time we saw these scenes. Let's go back to the screening room. Here we are, 30 minutes into the movie, and here's the second comedy sequence I've seen that's really heavy-handed. Well, I gave it a try, Captain, and it's not going to work out. Paula Prentice is complaining about her partner to her police bosses, but the writing here is gag lines, not natural dialogue. And Prentice, she's terrible. The way she reads her lines reminds me of Paul Lynn's wisecracking on the Hollywood Square. He's crazy. That's wacko. Do you understand? I'm not saying zany, balmy, or goofy. I'm saying he's a psycho. Name one crazy thing he did. It's a combination of things. He's gone round the bend. 
He's a candidate for a medical pension, a gold retirement badge, and a canvas blazer with wraparound arms. Name one crazy thing he did. He said he was going to make himself Christmas dinner. Christmas was two weeks ago. This isn't a police station, a real one. This is a shouting match, and it turns the scene into Joke City. Prentice right. comes off as a kooky lady, not a real person. A bad image of a woman. Why can't she be real? Clarence! Captain! Yeah, I'm a little busy right now, I... Natalie. I, if you could come back a little bit to do... No, Clarence! Nuts, Captain! I can't mm. get this open. You want to know what Friday was, Natalie? Hmm? Hmm? Russian Christmas. Here's Christmas. Oh. How you feel now, Natalie? I don't give a damn if it was Russian Christmas. There were other things. I like the formality here, the way they're deliberately a little stiff with each other to cover up their embarrassment of being attracted to each other. You can translate the lyric if you like. He sees a snowstorm howling behind the windows. The way they're circling in each other's arms here reminds me of the same sort of shot it was uh, Ingrid Bergman and Cary Grant in Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious. I loved you. So much. Malnikov. Let's have another drink. I like it that they made the leading character a Russian. I like ethnic characters in the movies rather than characters who aren't specifically anything or anybody. Robert Foxworth's got a nice shaggy appeal here as Volnikov. Paula Prentice hasn't had a movie role this good in a long time. She's really appealing. I like the slightly arch manner she brings to the role. It's like she's verbally holding herself at arm's length. What's he singing about? He says, the nightingales sing in the raspberry bushes. <laughs> they did the same thing with the casting here that they did in the onion field. They found good actors who haven't been overexposed yet. Nightingales sing in the raspberry bushes. That's a lovely thought. Now, here's what happens after the movie's over. Right after a screening, we never talk to each other about the movie. I give the movie three and a half stars. That's on the basic newspaper film critic scale of one to four stars. So it indicates that I like the movie, and I did like the movie a lot. I was kind of surprised by how much I liked it. When I go into a movie theater, I don't have a whole checklist of things that I compare against what I find on the screen. Instead, what I try to do is just sit there and let the movie happen to me, and then write a review that's the record of my feelings, of how I felt while I was watching it, and why. And hopefully, the idea is that the reader, by reading that, can figure out whether he or she would like the movie, too hope so anyway well, when you think of a newspaper office you usually think of people sitting around banging on old typewriters but we haven't used those for a while if you if you watch Lou Grant you'll know that we've now switched to computers and so now I'm gonna write my review on this computer terminal I'm giving the black marble two and a half stars which is sort of a middling review I don't know what Ebert gave it but two and a half stars for me means well, I wouldn't send my best friend to go see it. There are a lot of things I did like, and then there are a lot of things I didn't like. And that's really the essence of my review, at least that's what I'm going to try and communicate, which is that for every good thing I can name in this picture, I can name a bad thing. And that's how I decided to start my review, which is always a question, how do you know how to start? I started as a newspaper reporter here at the Tribune, so I try and come up with sort of a news lead, the dominant thing that I think about the picture, and that's going to be, for every good thing I can name, I can name a bad thing. One of the things I'm really going to get into in my review is the offbeat nature of this film, and it is offbeat. Not just the story, which is weird enough, but also this romance between the two police detectives. It's not often in a film that I get so wrapped up in the characters that I can really accept them 
and follow them as plausible actual human beings but i could in this case i really did care it's a very uneven kind of film one of the biggest strengths one of the biggest weaknesses there's two parts to the picture the strength is the cops and creeps story in here that veterinarian that weird guy they handle that beautifully the extortion plot that's very well done the bad part is the other half of the movie the romantic part i think that this guy joseph wambau has a very sure knowledge of cops and creeps he was a policeman himself i don't think he has a very good fix on these romantic ideas i'm sure policemen always think they're hard bitten and they always think they got that soft side his soft side he doesn't handle very well here's another thing in the film that's split one good one bad the acting harry dean stanton the veterinarian one of my favorite actors he's excellent here there's a lousy performance given in the film, though, I think by Paula Prentice, playing the love interest, the other cop. She th seems to think she's still on a love boat segment, plays it very loud, pushes it very hard, doesn't work at all. Strengths, weaknesses, all throughout the black marble. That's what's in my review. What I really found myself getting into in this review was the juggling act that goes on in this film, because there are so many different elements that you really wouldn't think would go together. You have the whole business of kidnapping the dog, the, the sad plot of the dog's lonely owner, the romance between these two police detectives, the Russian subplot with all the music and quoting the lyrics and so forth. This really weird, bizarre chase scene through the kennel with all the savage dogs barking at everyone. And you would think that these elements would fly apart, but somehow the movie holds them all together, so we really get involved, and it all works at the same time which really kind of impressed me, and that's basically what I said in my review right here. The Black Marble is a delightfully twisted comedy, backing into itself, starting out in one direction, ending up somewhere else, constantly surprising us with its offbeat characters. That's the first sentence in your review in the Chicago Sun-Times. Three and a half stars you gave it. That's a very enthusiastic reaction to the film. We have a big disagreement, you know. I was surprised how much I liked the film, especially since it did start slow, so I came to like it as uh, it moved along. I noticed in your review you gave it naturally two and a half stars, as you said. And you say that uh, Wambau here knows the world of cops and creeps very well. He writes about them with great style. However, Wambau also has romantic and cosmic pretensions that burden this film with symbolism and schmaltz that undercut his movie's fine, bitter edge. Yeah, and ba basically, I think your, your disagreement is with the whole romance. You don't want the uh, Foxworth Prentice subplot or uh, co-plot. You'd rather have the bit about the dog napping. As acted. Uh -huh. I got nothing against romance per se, but when it's badly acted and when there's mm -hmm. such another part of the movie that seems so strong, that extortionist, the dog napper, Harry Dean Stanton, a wonderful I loved him, too. I really did love well, him. Well, when I see something so strong and then something weak and flawed, next to each other, then I get a split movie and I want to push for that other stuff. Well, you know, Gene, I have to admit that the scene you picked uh, to criticize Paula Prentice's performance for was a good choice. I mean, showing a bad performance. Yeah. Her scene in the uh, police captain's office was very bad. At that moment in the movie, I was thinking, gee, I don't like her. I don't know where mm -hmm. this is going. Later on, though, she captured me. Their romance captured me. I got involved in it and I thought the performance picked up. By the end, I was really involved in what they were doing. And I sat there where you're, where you're revving up <laughs> and where you find the odd surprises, which you mentioned in your review. Where, uh -huh. you, where you're being surprised, I'm being alternatingly pleased and disappointed. Mm -hmm. And I put this film, as critics often do, I put this film up against the last one that the guy directed, The Onion Field. Mm -hmm. And there, too, I found that the, the tough world of criminals, beautifully handled. Here, also beautifully handled. That's Harry Steen Stanton. I just want to emphasize this guy is unknown i hope this film makes him the star he but really deserves in the public mind but again there's this soft stuff in there i don't know soft you, stuff you even agree in my split at all do you do you prefer the i story? see i see the split i applaud the split so often in a cop movie once you're familiar with the genre once you've seen a dozen or a hundred movies like this you know after the first 15 minutes what's going to happen here you didn't know here you could be constantly delighted by twists and turns that the plot was taking. Here you could say, this dog napping thing is insane, but I'm involved in it. Then here comes the romance. It's out of left field. They're in love on a serious level, but at the same time, they're crazy. They're funny. I enjoyed that way that the movie seemed to find itself free to go back and forth between various tones and moods. I if, really did. If he had been equally good in handling it, I would have felt the same way. But I think that it's one thing to know how to make thrillers, which he does. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to know how to do comedy, I don't think he does. Well, here's my bottom line. Now, I gave it three and a half stars, so obviously I think it's a pretty good movie. Usually when I go to the movies, I feel a separation between myself and the screen. I'm in the screening room, the movie's on the screen, I'm thinking about it. Here, a very rare thing happened. I got involved. I cared. And that, to me, is worth three stars if there were other good things in the movie, and I thought there were. 
a big split. We <laughs> ought to say that this was totally unprepared. We picked this movie at random and we ended up with a big disagreement. So much for this close-up view of a movie critic's job. The only job where you can get up from your desk in the middle of the afternoon, <laughs> tell your boss you're going to the movies, and he doesn't mind. <laughs> we'll be back again next week. Until then, see you at the movies. Well, a lot of time has passed since we recorded that special edition of Sneak Previews back in February of 1980, and uh, the returns are in on the Black Marble. It was a flop. It didn't do well at the box office. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid it didn't get very many good reviews either. In fact, my review is one of the few really favorable ones, and most of the critics tended to agree with Gene's position, which is that the pieces didn't fit. The parts of the film didn't come together. Well, how do you feel about that? Were you wrong? I was not wrong. I was right. I feel badly that more people didn't go to see this film. In the year and a half or more since I saw The Black Marble, I've seen a lot of films that didn't have one half as much comic originality, uh, as interesting characters, as much individuality. I think I was right about the film. Well, and I take pleasure in the fact that, not that the film failed, mm -hmm. but I think I found the flaw in the film. And as a critic, I can take legitimate pride in that, just as you can take pride in sticking to your guns about what you saw. <laughs> uh, I think that the film really should have played it more straight on the crime story, and I think it would have been a much more interesting picture. The romance just blew it out the window. People often ask movie critics, do you ever change your mind on a film? Do you ever go back and see it a year later? Do you ever revise your opinions? Yeah. I didn't in this case. I saw this film again oh. just a month ago, mm -hmm. and I had the same reaction to it. It was very entertaining. I have missed a couple of pictures over the years. I'm not infallible. And I have, there have been pictures that I just didn't fully understand, I think. But mm -hmm. this isn't the case with this one. I think I called this one right on the money, right away. The other thing that I felt about watching the show again was how great our jobs are. Mm -hmm. The pens, the lighted pens, where we sat, our fascination with that, the popcorn, the whole bit, the writing, mm -hmm. it's a fabulous job. Well, Gene, I think that's just an example of your arrested adolescence. You're going to be a moviegoer for the rest of your life. And me, too. That's it for this special edition of Sneak Previews. Join us again next week when Gene and I once again will be laboring away at our favorite job, going to the movies. <laughs> Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations.